Hi guys and welcome to episode 3 of Reptile Misconceptions at Peculiar Pets. Today we're going to talk about one of the most common species of lizard kept in captivity today and that is the leopard gecko. Uh, this little dude here is a Trempa sunglow and he's one of our breeding males. Um, he will probably just chill here for the whole video <laughs> so just kind of ignore him. So the first thing that I want to talk about with leopard geckos is their feeding. Now there's not a huge amount of misconceptions with this but there are a few ways that you can go wrong. So most people know that leopard geckos are naturally insectivorous or mostly insectivorous. They will actually take small vertebrates, so things like young rodents, nesting birds, that kind of thing, even smaller lizards, but it's not a massive component of their diet, so we don't tend to stress if we're not including that in captivity. Most people use a staple diet of crickets or dubia roaches or mealworms, and there's a little bit of a misconception around the mealworms. So there is a bit of a myth that mealworms are really, really hard to digest, which is kind of true. So the surface area to volume ratio on a mealworm is much lower than that of, say, a superworm or a moria worm, depending whether you're in the UK or the US. And that then means that if they eat too many of these worms, it can be harder for their digestion to get through that thicker shell and move it through the digestion. But in the same way as impaction, a properly kept animal that's got the right heat in, the right lighting, the right supplements, and is hydrated will just move those shells through normally, like it like it would a cricket or a locust or anything else. The other kind of myth with mealworms as well is that they are not very easy to gut load because they're quite small and quite tubular, so they're not overly nutritious, which is, again, I kind of get the theory behind it, um, but in practice, they will eat a wide range of food, so they're actually quite easy to gut load. So as part of a balanced diet, mealworms are actually totally fine to eat. One of the craziest myths about mealworms and moria worms as well is that if you don't crush the head on them, um, they will actually eat their way back out of your gecko. This is obviously not true. <laughs> it came around when there was a story about a leopard gecko that died and um, the mealworms had eaten their way into the animal and they'd left these little perfectly circular holes in the side of the animal and they were found all over the corpse that's what really happened is the mealworms ate their way back in because the stomach acid in most reptiles is designed to digest insects so once an insect goes in there as long as the animal is heated properly it's not going to survive long enough to be chewing big holes in your animal and if it did there's something wrong with the animal in the first place it's nothing wrong with the feeder itself that kind of brings us on to kind of a bit of a I suppose a bit of a dilemma that people come across sometimes on certain groups so with the larger scale breeder, so people like Ron Tremper, um, he used to sort of put it out there that he fed mealworms as a staple diet. And I think some for quite a few years, he only fed mealworms as a diet. And his geckos lived full long lives and there was no real ill effect seen from it. What we've sort of changed our ways a little bit over the years and we've started saying that a varied diet for pretty much all reptiles is what's beneficial. And that goes from leopard geckos right through to bearded dragons, blue tongue skinks, everything just seems to benefit from having a varied diet or at least a, a different kind of insect per meal. So there are those who say mealworms are perfect and you should feed them only those and that will make your geckos really big and they'll breed loads and they'll live amazing lives. And then there are others who say, no, you should only use crickets because mealworms can't be digested properly and crickets were easy to gut load. And then there's the kind of third group where it's like, no, you should use all of them. And then there are also people who say you should never use crickets uh, because they are full of parasites. This misconception has come around in several species now, and it's always crickets that get the rap. <laughs> crickets can naturally pick up pinworm um, in the same way as your gecko can naturally have salmonella in its system, but show no symptoms, which is why we don't advocate things like kissing your lizard or licking your hands after you've been handling your lizard. It's all very common sense kind of hygiene stuff. The crickets and pinworm thing is actually true. They do, they can carry pinworm um, and they can pass that on to your animal. But again, as long as your animal and the crickets themselves are being kept healthy and they're being hydrated, it shouldn't cause a major problem. Small parasite loads actually exist inside a lot of reptiles, even our pet reptiles, as kind of a standard gut flora. Now, I'm not saying that pinworm is nothing to worry about, like if you have a big infestation or if your animal starts to lose weight or show signs of an actual parasite problem, we would always recommend going to a vet and having that treated. 
but people then panic thinking that the second their leopard gecko eats a cricket, it's going to pick up pinworm, it's going to need to go to the vet, or it's going to lose all its weight, and that's just simply not true. The kind of long and short of this misconception section is feed a variety. So in the UK, we have about nine species of insect that are readily available now. Uh, so we have crickets and locusts, which are kind of our standard staples. Locusts tend to be sort of preferred by leopard geckos, and it's nothing to do with taste. It's literally the fact that locusts don't run. So when the leopard gecko is going after its food and the cricket bounces off into the distance, it's like, eh, can't be bothered with that. Whereas the locust kind of walk away and they're a little bit easier to catch. And they're a much larger meal as well. So you tend to get a really good response out of these guys for locust. Another commonly used staple, especially in uh, the US as well now, is uh, dubia roaches. Now, dubia roaches have their place and they should definitely be included in the captive diet because they're really high in protein, they're quite high in fiber, they're a really good food source, so easy to gut load and you can breed your own at home as well, which means you can save a little bit of money on like extra food bill. The downside to them is that protein level. So dubia roaches in bearded dragons uh, recently have been shown to have caused gout and a few other kind of uh, issues that we would link to being sort of eating a high protein or high fat diet. Similar to like we've said in the savannah monitors before, where they get like liver problems, heart problems, all those kind of associated things. And dubia have been linked to that when they're used as a sole feeder. So that's what we're saying is part of a diet. They're fantastic because they're really nutritious. But as a sole feeder, they're a little bit too nutritious and a little bit rich, and that can then lead to these problems with gout and liver problems later on in life. In the UK, we have three common worms that are available. So that's the mealworm, which we've just talked about. There's the morio worm or superworm here in the US. And they are basically, they look like a giant mealworm. They are another beetle larvae. They are a little bit higher in fat than mealworms. So we tend to stick those more as like a treat or as a way to vary the diet, but we don't want to overuse them. And they certainly don't want to be a staple diet for your gecko. But they're a big, big meal. They're good fun for the geckos to sort of chase around. And they're quite useful as well because you can tongue feed them. So the gecko gets used to you. And they're a good way to kind of build that relationship between you and the gecko as well. Then the third one is the waxworms. Now, waxworms are a, a, a moth larva, so a caterpillar. And they live in beehives, basically. They're, they're a pest in beehives. And because of that, their diet as a larva is, is honey. It's very, very sweet, very high in sugar. And that means that they are really, really addictive. And because they're really high in sugar, that makes them quite fattening for the geckos. So they've always been put out there as kind of this, like, can have one or two a week and this kind of thing. Which is true. Waxworms are a treat food, but they're not the kind of devil food <laughs> they're being made out to be. They're good for slowly adding weight to an animal if they're used as part of a varied diet. They are slightly addictive, so you have to be careful in how often you use them or in the quantities that you use them. And obviously they will lead to obesity if you feed them far too many at once. Um, but they're easy to store. If they're kept cool, they'll last quite a while without turning into moths. But when they do turn into moths, the moths are actually a really good food. And a lot of young geckos in particular will go mad chasing the moths around the enclosure. So waxes are kind of a, a double-edged sword. They're good to include, but we don't want to do them all the time because that just leads to more problems than it's worth. Another common feeder that we have in the UK is the uh, calci worm. Now, in America, these are called phoenix worms, and I believe they're also called neutral grubs as well. They're basically the larval form of the black soldier fly. So you'll also see them referred to as BSF. L, which is black soldier fly larvae. Um, they're really, really small, so they're great for young geckos. Adults will take them, but not as readily. They're really, really high calcium, quite well balanced as far as protein and fat. They are a good one to include regularly, but again, I wouldn't say to stick to one insect as your staple because it, it then just, we're then kind of negating all the benefits of all, all the other insects that we can use as well. Um, we also have in the UK uh, buffalo worms. Um, I'm not sure if they're available in the US, I can't remember. Um, they're another beetle larvae, great for hatchlings, but they're so tiny that they're about that big as adults. So, uh, sorry, as, as full larva rather. Um, so they're not going to be great for anything over maybe eight weeks or so, because they probably won't see them very well. Um, you can also use wood lice as well. Now, wood lice in the UK are used mostly as a cleanup crew for bioactive systems. Now, if you're keeping your leopard gecko in a bioactive system, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit later, um, you can include wood lice in there as part of your cleanup crew, and they will then be eaten by accident or on purpose by your leopard gecko as well. Now, the good thing with the, the wood lice is they're actually quite high in calcium. Uh, their exoskeleton is made of calcium rather than chitin, um, or rather it's calcified. And that means that when they do eat them, they're actually getting a good source of food, 
rather than sort of like kind of needing supplements and that kind of thing. So they're a good one to sort of include now and then if you fancy changing things up a little bit. There are also a number of other roaches you can use, like red runners, lobster roaches, all that kind of thing. They're all fine to use, but they're not as easy to get hold of unless you're sort of breeding them yourself. Um, the only feeders really that I would say to avoid are things that you know are toxic. Um, so uh, anything that's sort of wild caught. Now, wild caught insects is a bit of a grey area. Um, there are people that do it and do it very successfully. But if you don't know exactly what you're feeding or exactly what you're collecting, it's just best not to, to be honest. Uh, that goes for like house spiders as well. Although these guys love house spiders, you have to know for definite that it's not eating anything toxic and it's not been around pesticides or anything like that in your house. Um, another one sort of these guys aren't really keen on uh, was earthworms. We tried them on earthworms a while ago and they just sort of looked at them. <laughs> By all means try them, but ours really didn't take to them at all. <laughs> um, now in America you have another feeder um, that is very very popular, uh, not as easy to get but they're very very popular which is the tomato hornworm and they're a big blue grub. Um, they're actually illegal in the UK, they've been banned, um, but if you're in the US and you can get them, they're a great way to just round out the diet, they're really high in moisture, um, so they're just a good treat food. Because they're so big, you need like one to fill an adult gecko and they're usually good with that. And a lot of people buy those as like a, a one-off treat now and then and, and they'll sort of make a big thing out of giving that to their gecko and that's absolutely fine because they're, they're not a particularly bad food. The kind of final part of diet misconceptions, it, which we mentioned earlier, is that these guys do eat vertebrates in the wild, but it's not a big part of their diet. Now, if you go on YouTube, you will see endless videos of them eating pinky mice, fuzzy mice, green animals, all kinds of crazy stuff. If you want to do it, you can. You do not have to feed these guys mice. And if you do do it, use frozen thawed or pre-killed, don't feed them live and don't feed them wild caught animals and things like that. If you're gonna get mice, get mice from a breeder or a, a food supplier. So that way you know that they're clean, they've not been contaminated with anything. And most leopard geckos will enjoy the odd pink here, but we're talking a couple of times a year. The pinkies are useful for females that have just laid eggs, but they don't really need to be included in a pet's diet because they're already usually quite chunky. Um, this dude has had pinkies before, and as you can see, he's, he's quite lean. We don't really overfeed him but he gets like two a year. Um, and it's usually, if he's got a bit carried away with the females, we'll pop him a couple of pinkies and that'll just top him back up then to get him back up to weight. Because while the males are breeding, they often don't eat for a couple of weeks as well. So yeah, if you want to use pinkies, you can use pinkies. There'll be people that tell you your animal will instantly die if you feed it a rodent. That's not true at all. These guys are perfectly capable of digesting small rodents, but they do not need that level of fat and protein in their diet on a regular basis. So although it is kind of, interesting because it's something different to them and it gives you something different to feed them it's not something you should make a point of going out and doing it's usually when people give them to them it's because their baby corn snake hasn't eaten or things like that and that's totally fine but just don't make it a regular part of their diet and you shouldn't go far wrong with it the other kind of misconceptions with diet um, is the supplementation that we use so everyone kind of knows now basically that Lizards need some kind of supplementation. It's usually calcium and we use a multivitamin and not many people actually understand what's in the multivitamin. They just go, yep, yeah, I was told to use it. I have to use it. Leopard geckos, like all lizards, need a calcium supplement and that is because the insects that they eat are naturally imbalanced. So the calcium to phosphorus levels inside a cricket are pretty rubbish. So we add the calcium powder on there to try and balance that ratio back out and avoid problems like metabolic bone disease and, and the other associated issues with that. As far as the multivitamin, there are two types, broadly. <laughs> there are multivitamins that include vitamin D3 and there are multivitamins that do not include vitamin D3. I personally now provide UVB to all my breeding leopard geckos, so I don't use a supplement that includes vitamin D3. Our kit in store now includes UVB as standard and our leopard geckos leave with a supplement that doesn't include UVB. It doesn't include D3, sorry. That then means that the guesswork is taken out of it. Now, for many, many years, and we're talking decades, <laughs> these guys were fed on supplemented live food. They were given a vitamin D3 powder about once a week, or if they were using lower levels, they'd do it every feed. And that kept them going perfectly fine. They bred fine with it, they laid perfectly good eggs, and they lived long lives with it as well. The problem with it is that no one really knows how much D3 these guys actually need. So if we stick on, say, Reptivite, which is a Zoomed product, and we go, right, okay, it's had that once a week, 
and the animal actually needed slightly more or slightly less, we wouldn't really know. If we someone using the same setup was then using Nutribal once a week, which has about five times the level of D3 in it, are we then overdosing the animal or underdosing it still? And there's a lot of guesswork with D3, so we found it was just easier through reading all the research that is all out there and easy to find, and also just seeing how our geckos behaved as well when we put them under UV, decided that it was easier to take the guesswork out of it for us. Since using the UV for them, they bask all the time. He's an albino and he sits in UVB light pretty much every other day, which I think when we talked in the UVB video before, that's what we'd reported with the albinos then as well was that they usually sat out every other day for a couple of hours. If you're using one with D3, you have to be really careful that you know what's in it, in what quantities, because all multivitamins have D3 as well as A, K, B complex, C, all the other vitamins as well, and all of those can be under or oversupplied. And there's a problem usually, where, especially with products like Nutribol, where if they use it too often, it's not necessarily the vitamin D that they overdose on, but the vitamin A and things like that. So if you're then trying to like compensate for one and you overuse it you, and you end up overdosing on the other or undersupplying another, that's where the complication comes, which is why gut loading and supplementation and then using the correct lighting is a much easier way to provide your animal everything it needs than relying solely on preformed high toxicity vitamins, uh, sorry, high concentration vitamins. And that then sort of takes the guesswork out of it. There are people who still use no UVB and they supplement with D3 and it works absolutely fine for them. And this video really isn't meant to be out there, so I've gone on witch hunt for who does and doesn't use UVB. I now use it. I now recommend it to all my customers who have leopard geckos because it just makes life easier. And it's something they encounter in the wild and they have been found to be active at any time of day, just as the need takes them. Um, the term for that, because a lot of people will say these guys are nocturnal, which we'll talk about a bit later, but say these guys are nocturnal when really they're active when the need takes them. And the word for that is either <laughs> it's catamaral or cathemeral. And I do not know which the right <laughs> pronunciation of that is, uh, but it's C-A-T-H-E-M-E-R-A-L, if you want to Google it. <laughs> but yeah, that word means that they're kind of active as the need takes them. So if they're hungry, thirsty, mating, anything like that, if they need to go and bask, they will just do it. Whereas a nocturnal species doesn't come out until after sunri uh, sunset, and a, a crepuscular species is out at sunrise, at sunset, and that's then more things like your crested geckos and that, and, and that kind of uh, group of animals. But leopard geckos are active any time of day they feel like, and there is no real set routine for them. With that comes the fact that they then encounter UV in the wild. Um, so all of that kind of together meant we've just started saying, put UV on them. It's so much easier. Now that we have products like the Arcadia Shade Dweller and we have um, the new Reptile Systems Zone 1 as well, it's just so easy to provide the right levels of UVB for your animal without worrying that it's going to be oversupplied or it's it's going to sort of suffer because it's not quite the right output or we're balancing acts between like bulbs designed for other things. We just have the products now. And that's the same for supplementation without D3 as well. We now have products that don't include it. So we can use those and provide the UVB and know that everything is there and the animal can provide it so it can control its own intake of D3 by moving in and out of UVB lighting, as it would naturally in the wild. So, the next thing that we're gonna talk about for these guys is their actual setup, so like their environmental needs. Now, unlike in the Bearded Dragon video, I'm not gonna go through it sort of section by section because there just aren't as many myths with these guys. Um, so I'm gonna kind of lump it all together. So the first thing is the size of the enclosure. Now, for a long, long time, these guys were kept in really, really small enclosures. In America, usually the standard was like a 10 gallon, which is far too small in my opinion. And in the UK, we often use two foot standard vids for a single adult. Two foot for me is an absolute bare minimum for one adult gecko. It gives them enough room to move around. It's kind of the same equivalent of keeping an adult bearded dragon in a four by two by two, as far as proportion goes. So I'm kind of like, yeah, it's a decent minimum. However, these guys are seriously active. <laughs> When they get going and when they're healthy, they will move around, they will climb, they will use every space you give them. And now the standard on most of the groups is becoming 36 by 18 by 18, which I think is fantastic. Our kit is now that size of standard. Uh, we upgraded it recently from the two foot being standard and then having like a, an advanced kit that was in a larger enclosure. And we decided to just take the option out of it because people weren't going for the bigger enclosure because 
unfortunately cost is often the kind of deciding factor. So as far as I'm concerned, three foot is a fantastic size for them. There are people that go even bigger, absolutely nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, if you want to provide more room, provide more room. These guys really are active and there's nothing necessarily too big for them as long as you're providing the correct heating for them. That also goes for hatchlings as well. There's a couple of misconceptions, especially with geckos, where people say you can't put a hatchling into some really kind of like big elaborate enclosure because it won't ever find its food. The simplest answer to that is that the wild is a very big place and these guys find food. We can accommodate that quite easily in an enclosure by providing them with food in a dish or we can tongue feed them or we can just pop food in front of them and make sure it's not going too far. There really is no reason for them to start life in a smaller enclosure. We start them in something smaller because we have to house lots of them. <laughs> and that's always been kind of a thing is that the difference between breeder and shop and pet at home. You, you don't want your pet to live in a small space because you want to enjoy your pet, you want to see your pet, you want it to enjoy the fullest life that it can and that means then providing it adequate space to move, grow and, and sort of perform all its natural behaviours that it should do. That kind of links into sort of the decor in the enclosure. So there was a thing for a while, leopard geckos do not ever climb. They are found on the floor, they live in deserts and all this, and that has all turned out to be absolute rubbish. <laughs> Leopard geckos are not actually found in deserts. They are found in fairly arid environments, but they're not bone dry, sandy deserts. It's mostly rock, rocky areas, scrubland, shrub areas. Uh, they're also found in pine forest in a couple of the, the areas that they're found as well. So these guys really do experience quite different terrain to what we originally sort of perceived. So we tend to provide a lot of rocks, thicker branches, a lot of people do amazing fake backgrounds um, and they will use every inch of it. Um, and it's really nice to see that these kind of things are becoming more commonplace, but there is still that kind of resistance to change, um, as there is with many, many areas of reptile keeping where people are still adamant these guys don't need to climb. And it's not so much that they need to climb in the same way as a crested gecko that would suffer if we kept it in a low, shallow tank. These guys just enjoy climbing it's 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 activity for them it's enrichment for them to be able to go and explore a 3d environment instead of just living on kind of a bear tank floor with a hide on either end of a water bowl so if you want to provide climbing stuff for your leopard gecko please do um if you haven't yet by all means do and give it a try you'll probably find that your leopard gecko uses everything you provide it people have even used things like the, the ladders that you can get for like parrots and rats and things and they all work fine not my personal preference, I'd rather use like cork bark and, and branches and things like that. Um, but they all have the same kind of effects. As long as it's safe and as long as it can't fall on the animal, there's really no reason not to provide this climbing equipment for them. These guys tend to shelter in kind of like rock crevices and you can't get to a rock crevice in a rock wall without climbing the rocks. So it kind of all, when you use common sense, it all kind of makes sense. Alongside that as well is things like fake plants and live plants. Now, bioactivity has become a really big thing with all reptile keeping, and it's recently become quite commonplace in leopard gecko keeping. Now, I personally haven't tried it yet for leopard geckos. Um, I, Because most of my leopard geckos are breeders, I need to be able to find eggs quite easily. So although we do provide them with a loose substrate, we still make sure that the areas of humidity are contained. Uh, so we use like a, a lay box, basically just to make me finding eggs much simpler. But as a pet owner, going bioactive is a perfectly viable option. Now, I'm not gonna to go too much into it because like I say, it's not something I've done, so I wouldn't wanna sort of advise just on hearsay, but there is an amazing group, uh, Leopard, Leopard Gecko Advancing Husbandry, I think, or Advanced Husbandry, um, and they're big into their bioactive. There's also the Bioactive Leopard Gecko uh, on Facebook, which is a really, really good group. The resources are all there. It's perfectly safe, it's perfectly easy to do um, as long as you follow the kind of guidelines and you make sure that, you, that your gecko is healthy before you do it. Bioactivity provides a little bit more enrichment, we're using a much deeper substrate, we have humidity gradients, we have different, so we have live plants in there, we have a cleanup crew that encourages sort of like more active foraging like we were talking about with the wood lice, it's perfectly viable. Now that kind of links into um, substrate. Now. Substrate is probably the single biggest misconception with pretty much every lizard out there that's kept today. Now, like we said in our bearded dragon video, uh, loose substrate is not the cause of impaction. Uh, the cause of impaction, long and short of it, is basically 
poor hydration, poor supplementation, wrong heat, or the wrong lighting. And that is exactly the same for a leopard gecko, fat tail gecko, crested gecko, toke gecko, any lizard basically that's going to get impaction 99.99999% of the time they had an existing problem and it's usually husbandry related or an, or an existing medical condition as well can cause it. So when it comes to decorating an enclosure, substrate is a big part of that. So let's say if you want to go bioactive, that's great. If you just want to use a loose substrate, there's so many options now. Pro Rep, uh, Leo Life, Habistat, Leopard Gecko substrate. Pets at home have their own. I think they call it like Leopard Gecko sand or something like that. Um, there's just so many different variations. The Arcadia Earth Mix Arid is great as well. Anything that they can move around that isn't going to go mouldy, isn't going to um, cause any sort of like issues. So things like walnut... Um, and uh, the, the corn cob stuff. I hate them as much for leopard geckos as I do for bearded dragons. They just, they have no place anymore in, in keeping. It's time they just sort of disappeared. But as long as the substrate is safe and provides something that they can move around, dig in. The soil mixes are great because it allows them to dig an actual burrow. So it's again, more kind of natural behavior that they can perform. They're always my preference. You will hear many, many people on many, many forums still telling you that your leopard gecko must live on shelf liner or kitchen towel or newspaper because it will instantly die if it lives on sand, because it will eat one grain, die of impaction, and you will just become another statistic. It's not true. Shelf liner, for me, is, is in essence cruel. Um, these guys like to dig. They really like to dig. We have males that will upturn water bowls every night because they just go for a dig and the water bowl ends up full of soil stuffed in a corner somewhere it's more work for us but the geckos like it so we stick with it on shelf liner you are denying the, the ability to dig and forage and perform a natural innate behavior and um, they've they live in areas that they can dig they dig burrows to sleep in they dig burrows uh, sorry they dig to hunt and things like that Taking that away from them, in my opinion, is, is unfair and essentially cruel. Um, that also goes like with the other sort of decor that's in there, so sort of go back to uh, greenery and things. Fake plants are better than nothing. Um, I am really, really bad at growing uh, arid plants, so I don't tend to use live plants for my leopard geckos. Uh, but like I say, there's the information there to do it. They need a lot of light and they tend to be quite hard to grow, but people do it successfully. They're far better at it than I am. Um, so yeah, if you want to do that, it looks amazing. The uh, the enrichment sort of provided by that and the different sort of humidity gradients provided by that are very, very beneficial to the animal. It's just not something I'm very good at. <laughs> um, but fake greenery, even things like the Exoterra silk plants, Zoomed plastic plants, the standing plants, or the, the Komodo canopies that you can get, they're all fantastic because it just adds another 3D element to your environment. It's extra cover makes it look nice as well so the animal not only benefits but you can look at an enclosure that looks nice as well so it's kind of the enclosure behind me has a, a club tailed iguana in it and we tried fake greenery in there and he tried eating it <laughs> so we removed that but you can have the bare kind of barren thing or if you imagine that full of plants it looks much nicer it looks greener it looks fresher it looks more natural so yeah try and provide as much greenery as you can it just adds another element to your enclosure um, water dish should always be available. I've not really heard it about leopard geckos where they say you shouldn't provide it. You should. It doesn't need to be big. It's just a shallow dish to drink out of. Um, make sure that youngsters can't drown in it. It's rare, but it's something to be aware of. Um, and then the last kind of essential bit of decor, um, which doesn't so much cause problems um, or misconceptions, but it is sometimes a bit misunderstood as to why it's there. Humid hides. Humid hides are there to simulate a burrow, which is another reason that loose substrate is a good idea because these animals benefit from a burrow that we then fake by using a dig box or a, a, a humid hide. Um, there are several options for substrate you can put in here. Now, if you go fully bioactive, you can make a humid hide as just part of your substrate. So an area underneath some cork bark or a rock formation can just be kept humid. Sorry about that, my phone just rather helpfully cut out a mimid sentence. So yeah, if you're in bioactive, an area under a rock or a cork bark can be kept humid and you can use that as your humid hide. But if you are using a loose substrate like Leo Life or any of the soil mixes, you can provide an enclosed area that would then have higher humidity. Great products for that. So there's uh, the Exoterra Gecko Cave, which has a solid bottom, a little, little entrance in the side. And there's also the Exoterra Snake Cave, which does the same job. Um, you can literally just use a margarine tub or the Braplast tubs as long as there's a hole cut in the side, nice solid top to keep that moisture in there. 
um, and opaque uh, boxes work best as well. So some people just bury the box down into the substrate so that it's sort of covered by soil. Other people just choose to use a tub that's already opaque. Inside the box, there's a couple of different options we can use. Now, if you're using a soil substrate, you can literally just use that inside the humid hive, but keep that substrate humid. The Arcadia Rarid mix works quite well for this. Another option that people use is sphagnum moss. Um, it does work absolutely fine. Um, I've used it a few times. It does dry out a little bit quickly though, and it sometimes has a tendency to sort of pack down, um, and it's not then as beneficial for the animal because they, they just sort of sat on a wet uh, surface. The one that I tend to use for my um, nest boxes and humid hides for the, for the younger animals is EcoEarth or Cocoa Fibre, depending on what you want to call it. It's one of the few times I actually recommend this substrate because I don't like it as a substrate for leopard geckos. It, it just doesn't serve the purpose it needs to. But inside a humid hide, it holds that humidity really, really well. It allows them to dig into it as well, so it almost simulates them making the burrow bigger, uh, which is another kind of good natural behaviour to encourage. The reason humid hides are there, people say it's to help shedding, and it is, but these animals actually rest inside these humid hides in the wild, so they might be rock crevices, they might be underneath a rock, uh, underneath a fallen log, anything like that where the substrate is going to retain more moisture than, say, on the surface where it's much warmer, much drier. When they're asleep in these burrows, uh, they also breathe in humidity as well. Now, this is a really clever adaptation that a lot of reptiles have in arid environments for keeping themselves hydrated. It's often been sort of wondered like how animals get away with not drinking in the desert, and a lot of it's to do with things like early morning dew, so they can go out and drink when this, this moisture comes in. And also these humid burrows, they can actually breathe a significant portion of their moisture as well. So it's kind of a twofold thing. Um, so you should always, always provide a humid hide, and there are many, many options and ways that you can do it, and it's just whichever you prefer to do, really. It's much easier for me to use separate lay boxes because I can find my eggs, and I can also, for like quick clean outs on hatchlings, I know it's right, eco-earth out, get it dumped in, get it changed out, moistened up, whatever we're doing, and it makes maintenance much easier that way. But if you want it to look nice, there's loads and loads of different options that you can do, but it is a very essential piece of equipment that should always be available to your gecko. It used to be a thing where you only put it in when they were shedding. Over the years I've tried that and you miss it every time or you miss it once and then you've got to take the shed off and it just becomes complicated so it's easy to have it in there all the time because this then backup hydration system that they have works much more effectively if they always have access to a much higher humidity area within their enclosure. Another piece of decor that is often sort of overlooked is hides. Um, hides is a very broad <laughs> kind of uh, statement but Hides need to be enclosed, they need to be quite tight fitting, um, there's loads of different things you can use, you can use cork bark, you can use the Exeterra rock form hides, every brand makes their own rock hides, um, as long as it's enclosed and if you're using UVB as well it's important that it, it provides a complete gradient away from the light. UVB provision is all about option just in the same way as the humidity is as well, so if the animal can't hide completely from the UV it can't regulate itself properly. What you'll also find as well is providing hides with quite a wide opening, but it's sort of a deep um, actual hide area. Uh, the animal can also bask and utilise UVB at the entrance and then move further into the hide to then change its exposure that way. And that's a really clever way that these animals have sort of adapted to use UVB without exposing them completely to things like predators or, or poor weather or anything like that. So yeah, hides are a must. Most people go with one warm, one cool, and then usually have the humid hide around the middle of the enclosure. And that's kind of what we do and that works quite nicely for us. Other people choose to have like several all over the place and that's totally fine as well. The more clutter the better for these guys and that's the same with like the fake plants. They do kind of work as a hide as well. So just sort of go mad with it. Add more hides, add different hides, hides high up. You can really, really go to town with these guys because they will use all the decor that you give them. So yeah, that's kind of it for like the setup side of things. Um, as long as you've got your humid hide in there, you're giving them plenty of space, lots of things to climb, a nice substrate that you can dig in. So these guys set up is quite simple as far as reptiles go. And then it's quite nice as well because it's so varied in the ways that we can achieve these different um, sort of environments for them as well. The final and probably most controversial and most argued uh, misconception with leopard geckos is their heating requirements. Now, like all reptiles, these guys need a thermal gradient in their enclosure. We're usually in for a hotspot temperature around sort of 32 to 34, which is about 92, 95 uh, Fahrenheit. Um, and that is usually, traditionally, achieved using what we call an undertank heater or a heat mat, depending on what country you're in. 
Under tank heating was the kind of be all and end all of leopard gecko care for many, many decades. Um, and it became a misconception that these guys have to have belly heat to digest their food properly. There was even a scientific study, I'm not sure if it was particularly accurate or even scientific, but it put out there that animals that weren't provided with underbelly heating did struggle to digest their food. I genuinely don't know if that was peer reviewed or not, but someone sent me in an argument about this. My preference, and it is becoming much more prevalent with leopard geckos now, is to use overhead heating to achieve your basking spot. So, in the wild, heat comes from above. Everyone gets that. The heat comes from the sun, it warms up the environment, the air, the rocks, whatever these guys are, are, is around them, and they can then utilise that heat in different ways. The issue with just using a heat map for any reptile really is that they only produce infrared C. Now infrared C is not very penetrating. So it heats the surface of the animal and it gets them warm enough to move around, but it's essentially like when you put your hands near a radiator. You feel warm, but you don't feel warmed through. Whereas when you put your hands near a fire or in the sun, you can feel it kind of in muscles and that kind of thing. You feel warmed through, that nice warm glow that you get sat next to a fire. That's the difference between overhead heating and underbelly heating. So my preference is no longer to use heat mats for leopard geckos unless they're in a rack system because there is no other way to heat them. Um, but we do, our kit now includes a halogen lamp. Now, this causes problems because people go, they cannot have lights because they are light sensitive. The sun exists, and it's the quickest answer to that one. Um, halogen lamps are probably the closest heating element that we have to recreating true sunlight. Now that has to be used alongside UVB and visible light or UVA. Um, and that all together comes to producing a very natural heat source for these guys. Now halogen lamps produce infrared A, B and C. Now infrared A and B are both what we would call deep penetrating wavelengths. So they penetrate into the muscles and the tissues of the animal and heat them properly and thoroughly. This then leads to the animal being able to fully utilise that energy alongside its UVB or even without UVB it still works um, and that then means that the animal's metabolism works better, its entire system is more energised and it's just a better way to heat them. It is still prevalent that people will resist change when it comes to heating leopard geckos but this applies to all geckos as well, uh, to all reptiles as well in fairness. Halogen lamps are my preference and you can't really beat them as far as infrared provision and the visible light that they give off. They're also really energy efficient, which is great for me having so many enclosures. A 20 watt lamp for us in an 18 inch tall enclosure can give you a basking spot up to around 40, 45 degrees Celsius. So they really do pack a punch for very low wattage. But the benefits to the animal is the reason we changed over. Some people, um, might need night heating for the leopard gecko. And it, it's quite common, especially if you live in a, a particularly cool environment. These guys don't necessarily need a high night temperature, but they don't want it absolutely freezing at night. So a product called the Arcadia Deep Heat Projector is very, very useful for that. It doesn't give out visible light, but it does give out infrared B, and that allows then in, at night time, the animal can then come out and bask and utilize it appropriate wavelengths of UV if it is feeling a little bit, uh, of infrared, sorry, if it is getting a little bit chilly. Some people do prefer to use a ceramic heater as well, and that is absolutely fine for nighttime heating because we're just trying to put ambient heat in there, but ceramic heaters are not a daytime heater. They only produce infrared C, and again, just like the heat mats, it's only going to heat the sort of top layers of skin and muscle, and it's not going to give that beneficial penetration into the animal to get its metabolism fully energized and the animal functioning exactly how, how it should in the wild. So the heat mat thing, like I say, if you, people still do them in the kits, people still use them. I still use them in store for certain things, but it is not the best way to heat these animals. And it's certainly not the only way to heat these animals. It is an ongoing argument on forums, whether or not you should provide overhead heating or underbelly heating. And the science is there. The, the information is there. If you go onto the reptile lighting group, there are some amazing sheets on there that explain exactly why heat mats don't work the way that we think they do, exactly why halogens and deep heat projectors are just better ways to heat these animals. And really that's what this is all about, is trying to provide the best environment for animals in captivity. And now that we have the equipment to do this, like we were saying about the UV, there's no real reason not to. The only thing that puts people off using overhead heating is cost because a dimming thermostat is more expensive than a mat stat, a halogen and a fitting is more expensive than a heat mat, but the benefits to the animal are 
tenfold. And you can see the difference when you keep these animals in this way. They bask more, they're more active. Colour does improve, but that may just be through the fact that they're out a bit more and you see them more. Um, and I really won't go back. <laughs> now that I've changed, I will not go back to using heat mats for my adult leopard geckos because it's just not the best thing for them. Um, the, there are still groups that will not hear this, they will not have this said to them, but this is the biggest single misconception with leopard geckos, and it also comes through sometimes with royal pythons as well, is that they have to be heated from underneath, and that's not true. Using an, infrared, uh, an overhead heater that produces infrared A and B heats the environment, including the solid objects there, so not just the gecko, but the rocks and things like that in the environment. So if you provide a slate or a rock hide underneath your halogen or DP projector, that will then warm up and will hold heat and release it steadily through the evening. This then allows the animal to bask and gain belly heat if it really wants to. I'm still not convinced that they have to have belly heat because it seems a very strange adaptation to me for an animal that lives and takes its energy from the sun to need to be heated from underneath when the only real source of energy naturally is the sun. Whether that secondary energy out of a rock is available or not doesn't really make a difference because the sun is where it all came from originally. So for me, overhead heat for literally every animal out there and it's always halogen or DP projector for me. But like I say, you will hear all kinds of different versions of this and if you want the explanations to this and you want to know why I've changed my ways and a lot of people have changed the way that they keep their animals, the reptile lighting group on Facebook is the perfect place to start. The information is very easy to follow. It's all there in black and white. There's great images to go with it so that you can understand it properly. And it's just having tried it both ways, this is how we now do it. The difference in our animals is definitely there. Um, and it, it's like I say, it's all about providing the best for your animal. And now we have this equipment, use it is kind of the long and short of it. So yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Like I said, there aren't as many misconceptions about leopard geckos as there are bearded dragons, so it isn't an hour and 27 minutes long like the uh, bearded dragon one. If you haven't watched the beardy one and you've got a spare hour and a half, by all means, go and watch it. Um, but yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this and uh, catch you in the next episode. Thanks, guys. Bye.